Aaron, what's going on, man? Hey, Jordan. Thanks for having me on the show. So you're uh, you're in Tel Aviv right now. Is that correct? I am. It's a inferno of a summer. It's about uh, 87 degrees where I'm at. How about you? LA is not bad. Um, I got a question for you. Being in Tel Aviv and having a lot of clients in the US, what does your day look like? You know, just from like an hour's distribution standpoint, are you getting into the office at 2 p.m.? Is it a little different? I've always been curious, um, you know, when people work. Yeah, I'd love to tell you that I have work-life balance and that um, late nights uh, convert to, to late mornings, but they just don't. Um, so we've got, we've got, you know, burning the midnight oil and then showing up to work just like everybody else at around 9, 9.30, you know, in the, in the morning. Um, actually, Hiro straddles three time zones. We've got Tel Aviv, New York, and then San Francisco. Our customers are scattered throughout the U.S., so we've got, uh, we've got quite, quite a lot to cover. Um, but yeah, our marketing departments, got, you know, the creative side here in Tel Aviv, as well as the BDRs and our business development reps are on the phones, um, you know, doing, doing outreach, talking to customers at all hours. So, uh, it's, it's a grind, but you know, startups. Startup. Yeah. It's one of those things, right. Where, I mean, we talked about it a little bit offline, but the economy the global economy is in a weird place. It's probably the hardest time, at least in recent memory, to raise capital. Uh, so there really is this sprint from startups, one, to become solvent or show growth so that you like enough growth to raise, uh, and two, to quote unquote, trim the fat. Uh, now, what I see in a lot of startups is marketing always gets labeled as the arts and crafts department. It's this, when times are good, you got like 30 creatives on a team. <laughs> like the, it's, it can become a, you know, for lack of a better term, bloated. Um, and you'll have all of this stuff come in, but then as soon as times change and marketing has to report up the chain, you know, to executives and say, Here, hey, here's what we did to move pipeline or how we're attached to revenue. Um, a lot of marketers are unequipped to tackle that. So I'm curious how you and your team are, you know, showing your financial impact on the business uh, in a time when, you know, cost cutting is, uh, is in, it is a lot of businesses are doing it, layoffs, et cetera. So I'm very curious how you all do that. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'll say uh, in, in Hiro's case, I'm lucky that, the CIO, the CEO and I are on the same page when it comes to how marketing should be affecting bottom line revenue. Um, and I think we aligned on that very early on where I didn't want to be that arts and crafts department, although there is nothing wrong with being good at arts and crafts. Uh, everyone likes good paper mache volcanoes and things like that. Um, but for the most part, the way that marketing stays afloat, the way that marketing gets more budget, the way that marketing gets more clout, the reason why marketing would present to the board and why, you know, other departments would then start to collaborate more with the marketing department. It all comes from, can I show you that we've brought value this month, this quarter, this year? And a lot of that comes from being tied to uh, metrics that go beyond MQLs and, uh, and SQLs. And I think um, a lot of strong marketers at this point in B2B marketing, especially have done that. They've realized, you know, this maybe was a transformation that happened in the last five to 10 years that leads are great. Uh, if everyone downloads your report, that's cool. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you can't show how that affects an AE and their ability to close deals, um, or, you know, if a, a prospect is not referencing the fact that, um, you know, there are certain marketing materials or, or marketing output that's affected their perception of the company and, and their uh, willingness to, to sign a deal, then that's going to be a big problem. Um, and I think, you know, for our intents and purposes, what we've been doing for the last three years now, I've been at Hiro for four and a half years, but for the last really three years is we've only measured ourselves on SQOs and new pipelines. Now, bottom line revenue is, of course, amazing. And when it's available to us, that's great. But at the end of the day, what I'm really looking at is, did I give AEs enough pipeline to work on? And, and in terms of absolute numbers, did I give them 
enough coverage? So did I give them enough opportunities to actually work on? Um, and as long as I've done those two things, I've done my job correct. And my department has done their job correct. Um, and as long as you're aligned on what is right, a quality account and what is a, um, a, um, a qualified opportunity, you should see that trickle down into revenue as well. Um, so those are the three numbers that I present to the board, but predominantly the way we measure ourselves is based on opportunities and pipeline. And it's very hard to argue that you're not a successful department or that marketing should you know, cut their budget if top of the funnel is working smoothly in that way. Yeah, I like that. And I think that's something that, you know, I've always viewed B2B marketing really as the air cover, you know, the air cover to the sales team's, you know, foot soldier, so to speak, to make an army reference. And it's like, just if you're able to move in lockstep with your BDRs, your AEs, and actually go through and one, put together uniform messaging. So that's, you don't have a salesperson going rogue and creating their own message, like, you know, totally something out of the box or uh, promising something the product doesn't do or all of those things that uh, you can run into. I, I think it's like, if you're all walking in lockstep and you're creating that material and you're helping assist uh, opportunities, but then also equipping the AEs, you know, to send over stronger messaging that ultimately is going to drive, um, you know, bottom line revenue. And it stops the whole like infighting, the whole brother, uh, you know, twin brothers fighting, uh, which is sales and marketing in a lot of organizations. So it, it's good to do that as well. Um, how do you all systematically approach that with regards to aligning sales and marketing? Are you working together? Are you all in comp the meetings or yeah, how do you do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think there's naturally going to be friction between sales and marketing. And I, and I don't want to beat around the bush and say, oh yeah, there, there's a, th you know, there's some reason to strive for 100% harmony between the two departments. It, it can exist and it, and it shouldn't necessarily exist because if it did, I, I would feel that maybe it means both departments are a little bit complacent in where they are. So the sales team is trying to, should be measured, right? AEs should be measured on close rate. They should be looked at not just for the quota, not just for the amount of money they're bringing in, but also, wait, how many deals did you lose this year? I mean, if you were given 100 ops and you, you know, closed uh, uh, only three of those, but I guess that's, you know, equivalent of like $2 million in that organization, that's still a terrible metric. I mean, that's still a terrible result. So I think that it's very important to look at a close, um, the close rate, the close one rate, um, which means that AEs are going to be very restrictive sometimes about what they think they can and cannot close. And so even if you're bringing in qualified accounts with one of the right stakeholders, and especially this is true for B2B, you know, SaaS, there's usually a buyer group, there's going to be friction where the, the BDR might say, or the sales rep might say, hey, wait, I've brought you a qualified person from a qualified account. Why are you not pushing this forward? Um, and even if it's well-defined and you have pages of documents, there are, are always going to be loopholes and there are always going to be scenarios you didn't expect. And, and they'll come up, you know, the, these, these things will come to a head. That being said, there are a lot of, you know, ways that you can uh, restrict the volume of these kinds of incidents coming up. And that is by having a really amazing qualification uh, process that's been vetted by all parties. Um, we do that on a weekly basis. So we have an hour long meeting. Um, I recommend it for any sales and marketing org if you don't already, but basically we have an hour long meeting where we go through the qualification doc. We bring up examples. So calls also uh, opportunities that have been qualified and also opportunities that have been disqualified or sent to nurture. And we'll actually vet them to see, you know, okay, uh, does this, qualification process still makes sense? Do we still identify the right qualified accounts? Um, basically a sanity check, right? And, and so I think that that's one good way to stay aligned. And for the most part, we've gotten to the point where those incidents are few and far between. Um, but I love that our BDRs believe that, you know, the meetings that they're bringing should be qualified and that they're fighting to get credit for those because, you know, they're very passionate about the job they're doing and they're working hard to get them. And I like that our AEs also push back on that because they know, you know, that it's a little bit of an art too, not just a science. And there are some of these deals 
that are going to distract them from maybe bigger fish or, or deals with a higher propensity to close. And so I think that that friction is healthy, case in point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, alignment comes from just communication, really good cadence of, of meetings, um, you know, not overkill on the schedule, but just enough, enough that, uh, that there's, I think, a good flow of knowledge between both teams to understand where those points of friction are and make sure that we can work through them together. Um, and, you know, for us, and I, I think I'll speak to the account-based marketers out there uh, when I say this, but for us, there should be limited amount of confusion of what is a qualified account versus not when you have a good ABM motion. So if you really have identified the correct accounts and you've done your homework and the market intelligence is right, you have filters on that have to do with, you know, uh, revenue, headcount, um, tech stacks, so the types of integrations, et cetera, then the, the, the accounts should, you know, kind of qualify themselves. And I think that that's an important point as well. It's doing the homework. So as long as, you know, the teams have done the homework, aligned on it, and, uh, and the data is good, uh, you know, that's another way to eliminate any kind of friction around what should and shouldn't be tackled by the AE team. I like that. And there's a little bit of the, you know, iron sharpens iron. And it makes me think about, like, I'm a big NFL fan, and you see in training camps, you know, the guys on the same teams fighting, the offense and defense fighting, because there's natural friction when they're trying to elevate. And I think that can kind of permeate you know, over into the professional world too, where, yeah, you would, if it's all hunky dory, where we need a little bit of that pushback to get the best out of each other in a, um, you know, in a productive manner, right? Which I think is, that's the thing when we're all striving for the same goal, which is more deals closed, more also revenue retained. We don't want massive churn. Um, okay. Now, how do we do that? And like, I like what you're doing as well with having people in the meeting to go aligning on what actually makes a quality opportunity, a quality lead, et cetera. Uh, because what you said is so spot on. If an AE takes on too many opportunities and then now they're they're spending time on low leverage opportunities, it's actually taking away from working, you know, the, the bigger fish or the big, uh, really, really the accounts that can totally move or swing a business in one direction. So I like that. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about where positioning Hiro and, and some of the challenges on being a must have versus a nice to have. And what I, I mean by this, and I always come back to, if you open up your TV and you see Netflix, Hulu, Paramount Plus, HBO, okay, and we go down the list, right? And we come in and go, okay, we got to cut our TV budget by 10%. Like Paramount Plus is gone, day one. Okay, day two, I got to cut again. Okay, Hulu's gone, right? And I'm going to keep Netflix and HBO are my must-haves and the rest are all nice-to-haves. And, you know, so <laughs> I I like to think about this when I'm, um, when I'm going in with my agency to pitch and to work with clients. And uh, if we're on the SaaS side, it's like, how do I become the Netflix to their business, not the, you know, the Paramount Plus. And I'm interested with how you all do that. That's a great, first of all, it's a great uh, example to bring up. I think everyone can relate to just the ridiculous volume of streaming services that have come out in the last couple of years and that sit on their TV, either abused or not used at all. Um, but, you know, for me, what you just said resonates really well in, in, in the challenge today, because there's must have and nice to have for sure. And there are ways to guarantee that you can become more of a uh, must have than, uh, than a nice to have. But at the end of the day, it's subjective because you might delete, you know, the Disney plus, but someone else might say, I don't, I don't even, what do I watch on HBO? Right. I'm going to keep Disney plus because it's nostalgic and, and I love uh, cartoons. I don't know. Um, and so I think uh, the, the thing we're seeing in B2B SaaS and, uh, and with big enterprise accounts is, again, you have this buyer group and you have to find the person who looks at you through the lens of, of must have versus nice to have. And so you have to really seek out the stakeholders, you know, and for us being a conversational AI company in healthcare, our stakeholders are typically the chief digital officer and the, and the chief information officer. Those are the people who think we are must haves. 
uh, versus potentially the chief revenue officer, right? Or the, the chief operations officer who don't understand the tech as much. And to them, it's a nice have. It's a nice layer on top of their other tech stack, right? Their, their tele telephony solution or whatever else they've put on their website. Um, and so you have different stakeholders that might have different perception of what is must have versus nice have. And those are the ones to lean on, especially in these times. Um, the other thing is to make sure that uh, you can create a fan or, or you can create a believer in the must have of what you're offering um, out of someone who's, of course, a budget holder. And so for us, we're lucky in that the CIO or the chief digital officer of a health system is usually also someone who relates to budget. But if not, you've got to work extra hard to make sure that you can show ROI. Um, you have to make sure that you're coming to them with, uh, with validation. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's to convert them essentially from somebody who believes that the solution, you know, would uh, move the needle 2% versus 50% in actuality. And to get them to believe you when you say that you'll move in that, you know, to that uh, multiple, you've got to show them case studies and you've got to be more personalized and you maybe you've got to meet them face to face at a trade show. Um, so, uh, yeah, to your point, you know, Sorry to go off on maybe a, a little bit of a tangent here, but to your point about uh, must have versus, versus nice to have, for us at Hiro, we, as a, a tool to help health systems automate, you know, 47% of the healthcare workforce is planning to leave the industry by 2025. A third of them claim it's from burnout. Uh, so Hiro, you know, our place in the market is usually going to now be a must have solution. They're going to lose labor fact they're going to need solutions to offload a lot of the different workflows and traffic that's coming into that health system fact and we're in prime position pole position to really uh, inherit a lot of a lot of that work and through ai assistance offload a lot of the repetitive excuse my french crap that's coming into their call centers their websites um, and making their lives easier so in the next you know, even now, but also in the next two years, especially, uh, we know that we have more of a must have situation. And if you're a company that doesn't, then you really need to create a narrative around validation, work with customer success managers, work with product teams, but you really need to go to bat. I would choose, you know, let's say three top metrics that can relate to either revenue driving or cost saving initiatives in the, for the organizations you're targeting. And, and get that in tow, because otherwise it's going to be very difficult uh, to prove value, um, to keep customers through value, and and ultimately to sell when people are tightening tightening their belts and and you know they're hiding their wallets. So it's it's kind of it's like if we take the view of what we talked about at the start of this conversation, where all the pain points that we have internally with tying our job function to revenue. All the accounts we're going after have those same pain points within their orgs. So identifying, acknowledging what those are, and then the same way that we arm AEs and arm BDRs, we have to actually arm our prospects to become the internal champion to sell for us. When, they, when we meet them at the conference and then they go back and they're able to be like, having those bullet points or having the little things that they can do to champion in the product are, are so important. And I think a lot of that comes from when prospect, I hate the word prospects, but when people in other orgs are, you know, people you want to do business with, when they feel seen in the marketing process and are acknowledged as an individual, then they have personalized marketing. When they're at, like, we talked about a little bit offline, when they're not just sent uh, some blanket communication, you know, insert bracket, bracket, name, bracket, bracket, like we actually can personalize the messaging. I think it goes a long way. Um, how important has, I guess, one, personalization of messaging been? Um, and then two, if you're looking at things like maybe customization or fluidity with regards to the messaging for each prospect? Um, excellent question. So personalization is probably a top three, um, I don't know, uh, top three pillar for good marketing in 2023 and beyond. Uh, the other two, I would say, and I mentioned it just before, but it's a key word, I think, for all marketers is validation. So getting good case studies 
uh, working with the CSMs, the product teams to get really solid case studies, iron tight case studies that relate to the other accounts you're going to go after, um, hopefully around their same headcount size and, and revenue size and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then the third one is creative, uh, creative content, unique content. Um, and, and I think all three of those come together to kind of be the spear that penetrates these people's um, bullshit shields that they've built. Um, and that has to do, of course, with the hottest buzzword, you know, ever, um, maybe in my lifetime, generative AI, uh, because everyone is essentially now using these tools combined with the automation, like you talked about the insert first name, et cetera, to create even more um, very generic um, um, uh, content that really is not resonating with people, just like automation didn't resonate with people. Now you've kind of uh, compounded the, the issue. Um, so I think personalization is more key than ever. We talked about, um, you know, needing to be a, a must have versus a nice have. I mean, if you're going to get people to buy into this narrative that whatever you're selling, your product is a nice to have, uh, sorry, a must have versus a nice to have, you're going to need to speak to challenges um, or, you know, initiatives that uh, a person is going through themselves or leading themselves. And uh, if you can't do that, you're probably going to fall on deaf ears and you're going to just join what is becoming increasingly deafening white noise uh, because of AI and automation. So personalization is key. If you can personalize with validation, even better. And if you can do that in a creative way, so if you can really, you know, kind of pierce the, the veil with uh, just creative content. So think outside the box. I think that's even more critical today than it was before, um, which sounds trivial, but it's not because most marketers now are looking at, okay, how do I just create more, but not how do I create brilliance? How do I create something that's actually a, a different and unique? Um, and everyone's scrambling to kind of just do the volume game now because of the tools at their disposal. Just because they're there, it doesn't mean you should use them. And if you do, um, you can use them in a way that, you know, and maybe in the process, step one or two versus, uh, you know, steps one through 10. And I, I think that that's still something people are figuring out and uh, justifiably so. This is all pretty new to us. Yeah, I think it speaks to human nature of wanting to cut corners too with the amount of AI and fluff content. Like it's the, the content that I'm seeing produced by GPT and all of this stuff. I mean, I, I don't know about you. I can tell within three seconds now I'm like, and yep, that's, that's generative AI. I'm like, that's crap. That's fluffy. That's using a bunch of transition words that nobody would actually use in real conversation where on the flip side, it, or kind of to rewind here, it's like, I'm seeing the same five email sequence from every single tech company trying to sell me. And I'm just like, I'm thrown aback by how unoriginal it is, where instead it take a company like Hiro, you're probably better off to buy 50 stethoscopes, literally write handwritten cards, send them to CIOs and be like, you're the heartbeat of the business, you know, call me. And it's like, that's going to probably outproduce some, some cold email campaign. So I'm always like looking for those types of things where I'm like, where, when everybody's doing this, how can we do something different? Right. Um, and see how that comes through. Uh, Aaron, this uh, this has been awesome. Uh, for people who want to connect with you online, where should they head? And then also, where can they learn a little bit more about Hyro? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm not sure how many of the listeners work in enterprise health systems, but if you do, uh, Hyro.ai is where you can find out more about what we're doing in the space of conversational and generative AI. And then I'm on LinkedIn, uh, Aaron Bors, um, feel free to connect, reach out. Um, yeah, that's probably the best place to find me. I haven't adopted the Twitter game yet. So Twitter might collapse next week anyway. So <laughs> it's probably good to stay with LinkedIn. There you go. <laughs> um, I've invested wisely. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Aaron, thanks again for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. This was awesome. Really appreciate it, Jordan. All right, everybody, that's it. As always, hit the like, share, subscribe, all those fun buttons at the bottom of your podcast app or on YouTube.